everyone, it's Molly. Um, today I am going to talk about another new book that we have here in the young adult section at the library. Um, the book that we're going to talk about today and read the first chapter of is Song of Silver, Flame Like Night by Emily Wen Zhao. And this is going to be an Asian fantasy, high fantasy book. It's also listed under young adult, of course, uh, Mythology, Romance, Dragons. So if there's dragons involved, I know I'm going to like this. I love dragons, and there's an awesome dragon on the cover. Um, so I went ahead and looked up the Goodreads reviews for this book, and on Goodreads it gives it an average of four stars, which is pretty good. Um, now some people might say it deserves five stars, some people might say it deserves two stars, but that's up to the reader. You might love it, you might hate it, but that's the beauty of reading and deciding what we want to read and deciding what we like to read and it's okay what you like to read. So we're going to talk about also a couple things that some people on Goodreads have said. Someone said that this is a fabulous start to a brand new series. So this is the first of a new series. And they said that it's lyrical, adventurous, and heartfelt is something else that someone said. So just going off of some of the reviews, I think it's going to be really good. Um, now this book was just published in January, so like I said, this is the first book. The next one, it might take a year before the next one comes out. That's usually the case, but we'll see. So let's go ahead and read the first chapter of this. Um, the first chapter is about 17 pages, so it'll be a little bit longer um, than a lot. So let's do that, and um, let's go ahead and read the synopsis too. Let's go ahead and read the synopsis. Once, Lan had a different name. Now she goes by the one the Atlantean colonizers gave her when they invaded her kingdom, killed her mother, and outlawed her people's magic. She spends her nights as a song girl in Hakong, a city transformed by the conquerors, and her days scavenging for what she can find of the past. Anything to understand the strange mark burned into her arm by her mother in her last act before she died. The mark is mysterious, an untranslatable hen character, and no one but Lan can see it until the night a boy appeared at her tea, her tea house and saves her life. Zen is a practitioner, one of the fabled magicians of the Last Kingdom. Their magic was rumored to have been drawn from the demons they communed with. Magic believed to be long lost. Now it must be hidden from the Atlanteans at all the Atlanteans at all costs. That's E L A N T I A N S. I keep saying Atlanteans. When Zen comes across Lan, he recognizes what she is, a practitioner with a powerful ability hidden in the mark on her arm. He's never seen anything like it, but he knows that if there are answers, they lie deep in the pine forests and misty mountains of the Last Kingdom, with an order of practitioning masters planning to overthrow the Atlantean regime. Both Lan and Zen have secrets buried deep within, secrets they must hide from others and secrets that they themselves have yet to discover. Fate has connected them, but their destiny remains unwritten. Both hold the power to, to liberate their land, and both hold the power to destroy the world. Now the battle for the last kingdom begins. And in the first uh, couple pages, there's a, first there's a map um, of the last kingdom. So we have a really cool map here, shows um, the Shaklahira, Amaran Desert, different land masses, different cities and structures, which is really cool. I always like when there's a map um, in a high fantasy novel because it's a, usually it has to do with world building, you know, creating a whole new world, a whole kingdom that doesn't exist, you know. And then in the first um, couple pages, right before the first chapter, we have some chronology, 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 I'm sorry. We have some chronology here um, of the Warring Clans era, 500 cycles, First Kingdom, cycles 0 to 591, so some little bit of historical context, if you will, for this story. <clears throat> okay, so let's go ahead with the first chapter. In the first chapter, we have a quote. Power is always borrowed, never created by Dao Zi in Book of the Way, Classic of Virtues 1.1. Atlantean Age, Cycle 12, the Black Port, Hot Gong. This is our location and, and uh, period in history for the story. The last kingdom had been brought to its knees, but the view was mighty fine from here. 
Lan tipped her bamboo hat over her head, parting her lips in pleasure as the cool evening breeze combed through strands of her silky black hair. Sweat slicked her neck from the afternoon's work of hawking wares at the local Eve market, and her back ached with the beating she'd received from Madame Meng for stealing sugar plum candies from the kitchens at the tea house. But in rare moments like this, when the sun hung ripe and swollen as a mandarin over the glittering sea, there was still a shattered glass beauty to be found in the remnants of a conquered land. The city of Hot Gong unfurled before her in a patchwork of contradictions. Red lanterns were hung from curved, st curved temple eve to gray shingled rooftop, weaving and winding between pagodas and courtyards wreathed in the halo of light bazaars and evening fairs. On the distant hills, the Atlanteans had settled on higher ground, building their strange architecture of stone, glass, and metal to watch over the hen like gods. The skyline glowed a dusky auric from their alchemical lamplight that spilled through stained glass windows and arched marble doorways. Lan rolled her eyes and turned away. She knew the story of the gods, any gods, to be a big steaming bowl of turd. Much as the Atlanteans wished to pretend otherwise, Lan knew they had come to the last kingdom for one thing, resources. Ships full of powdered spices and golden grains and verdant tea leaves, chests of silks and samites, jades and porcelains, left Hakong for the Atlantean Empire across the sea of heavenly radiance each day. And whatever was left over trickled into the black markets of Hakong. At this bell, the Eve market was in full bloom, merchants having filed in along the jade trail with jewels that gleamed like the light of the sun, spices tasting of lands Lan had never seen before, and fabrics that shimmered like the night sky itself. Hat Gong's heartbeat was the, kink, the clink of coin, its lifeblood the flow of trade, its bones the wooden stalls of marketplaces. It was a place of survival. Lan paused at the very end of the market. She took care to lower who her her Jwali, her bamboo hat, over her face lest any Atlantean officials prowled nearby. What she was about to do could very well earn her a spot on the gallows, along with another hen who had broken Atlantean laws. With a surreptitious glance around, she crossed the street and made for the slums. This was where the illusion of the last kingdom ended and the reality of a conquered land began. Here, the cobblestone streets carefully constructed by the Atlanteans after the conquest faded to dust. The elegantly reno renovated facades and shiny glass windows gave way to buildings crumbling from disrepair. The trading house sat in a derelict corner, its cheap wooden doors chipped and faded with time, paper windows patched with grease yet sagging with the humidity of the south. A wooden bell tinkled somewhere overhead as Lan stepped inside. She shut the doors and the hubbub of the outside world fell silent. The interior was dim, dust motes swirling in the late afternoon sunlight that spilled onto cracked floorboards and shelves crammed with an assortment of scrolls, tomes, and trinkets. The entire shop looked like an oil painting left to fade in the sun, smelling of ink and damp wood. But this was Lan's favorite place in the world. It reminded her of a time long past, a world long gone a life wiped from the pages of the history books. Old Wee's pawn shop dealt in odds and ends of goods left over from the Eve market after the Atlanteans had their pick, purchased by the shopkeeper at wholesale and sold to hen buyers at a thin margin. The shop escaped the, no the notice of government inspectors for secondhand goods held no interest to colonizers as long as they weren't made of metal. This was why the shop had also become a hub for contraband the wares of Old Way had, an, had on display were innocuous enough, reels of wool, hemp and cotton, jars of star anise and bay leaves, scrolls of cheap paper made from pounded dried bark, but hidden somewhere inside the shop, Lan knew, was something for her, something that could cost her life. Old Wee, she called, I got your message, silence for a moment, and then, thought I heard your silver bell's voice, come to bring me mischief again? The old shopkeeper announced himself in a shuffle of feet and a hacking cough. Old Wee had once been a teacher in oops, sorry, had once been a teacher in a northeastern coastal village. Before his family was killed and he'd lost everything in the Atlantean in the Atlantean conquest twelve cycles ago. 
He'd fled to Hutgong and used his literacy to pivot into the trading business. Constant hunger had whittled him to a stick, and the damp air of Hutgong had afflicted him with a permanent cough. That was the extent of what Lan knew of his life, not even the true name, banned under Atlantean law and reduced to a monotonous single syllable. Lan gave him her sweetest smile from beneath her Dao Li. Mischief? she repeated, matching his northern dialect and tones harsher and rolling compared to the sweet, sing-song southern tones she'd become used to. It was a rarity to speak either of these ways. When have I ever brought you mischief, old wee? He grunted, casting her an appraising look. <clears throat> Never brought me fortune either, and I, and I still let you come back each time. She poked her tongue out. Must be my charm. Ha! He said, the word cracking through a thick layer of phlegm. Any gods watching would know what lies beneath that charm. There are no gods watching. It was a point she often liked to debate with Old Wee, who was a stout worshipper of the hen's pantheon of gods, in particular his favorite, the god of riches. Old Wee liked to tell Lan he, de he devoutly prayed to the god of witches, riches in his childhood. Lan liked to remind him that the god of riches must have a twisted sense of humor to have rewarded him with a run-down contraband shop. There are, Old Wee replied, Lan raised her, her eyes heavenward and mouthed the words with him, words she had heard a hundred times. There are old gods and new gods, kind gods and fickle gods, and most powerful of them all are the four demon gods. Lan preferred to not believe that her fortunes lay in the hands of some invisible old farts in the sky, no matter how powerful they might be. Whatever you say, old wee, she replied, leaning over the counter and cupping her chin in her hands. The old shopkeeper wheezed a few times, then asked, Eve Market again? What, is the tea house not feeding you enough? They both knew the answer to that. Madame Ming ran the tea house like a glass menagerie, and her song girls were her finest display. She fed them just enough to keep them duly and ripe for the picking, but never enough so that their bellies grew full. Gods forbid they become lazy or fat. I like it here, Lan said, and she did. Out here, hawking alongside other vendors and pocketing the coin she made into her own pockets was where she felt some semblance of control over her life, a taste of freedom and free will, if only temporary. Besides, she added sweetly, I get to drop by to see you. He cast her a shrewd look, then tisk and wagged a finger. Don't try your honey words on me, Yatu, he said, and bent to the cabinets beneath his counter. Yatu girl. It was what he'd called her since she'd fa he'd found her, a scrap of an, orphan, of an orphan begging on the streets of Hatgong. He'd taken her to the only place he'd known that would welcome a girl with no name and no reputation, Madame Ming's tea house. She'd signed a contract whose terms she'd barely been able to decipher, and whose length only seemed to swell and swell the harder she worked. But at the end of the day, he'd saved her life, gotten her a job, put a stable roof over her head, it was more kindness than she could ask for in those times. She grinned at the sour old man. I would never. Old Wee's grunt turned into a bout of coughing, and Lan's smile slipped. The winters down in the south had none of the biting cold that she'd grown up with in the northeast. Instead, it encroached with a damp chill that sank into the bones and joints and lungs and festered there. She took in the state of the battered old shop, the shelves that stood further than usual, tonight on the eve of the big festivities for the twelfth cycle of the Atlantean conquest, security had been tightened around Hot Gong, and the first thing people tend to avoid in those circumstances was a shop trading in illicit goods. Lan couldn't afford to dally either. Soon the streets would be crawling with Atlantean patrols, and a lone song girl in her midst was an invitation to trouble. Long's acting up again, old wee? she asked, running a finger over a small stained glass dragon figure on the counter. Likely a prized trade from one of the jade troll nations across the great Amerian desert. The hen had not known glass until the era of the Middle Kingdom, under which Emperor Jin, the Golden Emperor, established formal trade routes reaching all the way west to the fabled deserts of Masiria. Ah, uh, yeah, the shopkeeper said with a wince. From the folds of his sleeve, he drew what, what, what must once have been a fine silken handkerchief and patted his mouth with it. The cloth was sodden and graying with grime. 
Ginseng princes have shot up since the Atlantean farts learned of its healing properties. But I've lived with these old bones all my life, and they haven't killed me yet. Nothing to worry about. Leanne drummed her fingers on the wooden counter, polished with the coming and goings of so many others before her. Here was the trick to surviving in a colonized land. You couldn't show that you cared. Every hen you came across would have his share of sob stories, family slaughtered in a conquest, home pillaged and plundered, or worse. To care was to allow a chink in the armor of survival. So Lan asked the question that had been brewing in her chest all day. Well, what do you have for me? Old Wee gifted her a gap-toothed smile and bent beneath his counter. Lan's pulse began to race. Instinctively, she pressed fingers to the inside of her left wrist. There, imprinted into flesh and sinew and blood, was a scar that only she could see, a perfect circle encompassing a character in the shape of a hen word that she could not read, sweeping strokes blooming like an elegantly balanced flower, blossoming leaves and stems. Eighteen cycles she'd lived, and she had spent twelve of those searching for this character, the only clue to her past that her mother had left her before her death. To this day, she could feel the searing heat of her mother's fingers on her arms, the hole in Mama's chest bleeding red even as the world erupted in blinding white. The expensive lacquer wood furniture of their, sturdy darkened with, of their study darkened with blood, the air filled with the bitter scent of burnt metal and something else, something ancient, something impossible. Now, I think you'd like this one. She blinked the images dissipating as old we emerged from the dusty shelves and placed a scroll on the counter between them. Lan held her breath as he unfurled it. It was a worn piece of parchment, but even with one look, she could tell that it was different. The surface was smooth, unlike the cheap papers made of hemp or rags or fishnet, common these days. This was true parchment, vellum, perhaps, signed black in the corners and smudged with age. She'd know the feel of it intimately, once a world ago. Between the wear and tear, Lan could make out faded traces of opulence. Her eyes raked over the sketches of the four demon gods in the corners of the pages, barely visible but present nevertheless. Dragon, phoenix, tiger, tiger, and tortoise all face in the center of the scroll, frozen in time. Swirls of painted clouds adorned the top and bottom margins. And then, there. In the very center, ensconced within a near-perfect circle, a single character, blooming with the delicate balance of a hen character, yet with nothing recognizable. Her heart jumped into her throat as she leaned over it, barely breathing. I thought you'd be excited, old Wee said. He watched her carefully, eyes glinting with the prospect of a sale. Wait till you hear where I got it. She barely heard him. Her pulse thundered in her ears as she traced the strokes of the character following every line and comparing it to the character she'd memorized well enough to know in her dreams. Her excitement faltered as her fingers stuttered over a stroke. No, no. A line cut too short, a dot missing, a diagonal slightly off. Minute differences, but all the same. Wrong. She slumped, letting out a sigh. Sloppily, she rotated her fist, fing her wrist, finger tracing a loose circle to finish up the character. That was when it happened. The air in the shop shifted, and she felt as though something inside her had snapped into place, an invisible current that rushed from her fingertips into the shop, like a static shock in winter. It was gone in half a second, so quickly that she must have imagined it. When she blinked again, old Wee had still was still watching her with pursed lips. Well, he asked eagerly, leaning forward over the counter. He hadn't felt it then, Lan touched the tip of her fingers to her temples. It hadn't been anything, a momentary lapse in focus, a trick of the nerves brought on by hunger and exhaustion. It's a bit different, she replied, ignoring the familiar disappointment that curdled in her stomach. It had been close, so close, and yet it wasn't. Not what you're looking for then, old Wee said, clearing his throat. <clears throat> but I think it's a start. See here, the syllabary seems to be composed in the same style as yours, with those curves and dashes. But the circle outside is really what caught my attention. He tapped two calloused fingers to the page. Everything we've seen with a circle around the chart, the character, has been there only for decoration. But see how these strokes bleed into the circle. They were written in a conjoined line, a clear beginning and an end. 
She let him drone on, but really her mind reeled with a crumbling realization that she might never understand what had happened the day her mother died and the last kingdom fell, that she might never know how it was possible that her mother had reached up, fingers trembling, slicked with red, and with her skin bare, burned, something into Lan's wrist. Something had remained after all these cycles in the form of a mark visible only to Lan, a memory that existed between dream and imagination, the faintest spark of hope for what shouldn't be possible. Hear anything I just said? Lan blinked, the past swirling away like smoke. Old Wee was giving her the stink eye. I was saying, he said with the peevishness of a teacher who'd been ignored by his pupil, that this came from an old temple book house and was rumored to have originated at one of the hundred schools of practicing themselves. I do know that the practitioners of old wrote in a different type of script. Her breath caught at the word practitioner. Land curved her lips into a smile and, lit and slid forward, propping herself on one elbow on the counter. I'm sure the practitioners wrote these alongside the Yao Mogui Gua, Mao Yao Mogui Guai. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I tried. Uh, they bargained their souls to, she said, and old Wee's face dropped. Speak of the demon, the demon comes, he hissed, glancing around as though one might jump out from behind his cabinet of dried goji berries. Do not curse my shop with such pretentious sayings. Lan rolled her eyes. In the villages where old Wee was from, superstitions ran deeper than in the cities. Stories of ghouls haunting villages in forests of pine and bamboo, of demons eating the souls of babies in the night. Such things might have sent shivers up Land's spine once, given her second thoughts about walking in the shadows, but now she knew there were worse things to fear. It's all just folklore, old Wee, she said. Old Wee leaned forward close enough that she could see the tea stains in his teeth. The dragon emperor might have banned such topics when he founded the last kingdom, but I remember the tales from my grandfather's grandfathers. I have heard the stories of ancient orders of practitioners cultivating magic and martial arts, walking the rivers and lakes of the First and Middle Kingdoms, fighting evil and bringing justice to the world. Even when the emperors of the Middle Kingdom attempted to control practitioning, they couldn't hide the traces of evidence across our lands. Tomes written in characters that are indecipherable, temples and secret troves of tre treasures and artifacts with properties inexplicable. Practitioning, practitioning magic has always been ingrained in our history, Yatu. Old Wee was one of those ardent believers in the myths of folk heroes, practitioners, who had once walked on water and flown over mountains, wielding magic and slaying demons. Perhaps they once had, long, long ago. Then where are they now? Why haven't they come to save us from this? Lan gestured at the door, at the dilapidated streets, at the old man's hesitation, her lip twisted. Even if they did once exist, it was probably centuries and dynasties ago. Whatever folk heroes and practitioners of old you believe in are dead. Her voice softened. There are no heroes left for us in this world, old we. Her friend gave her a penetrating look. Is that what you truly believe? He said. Then tell me, why is it that you make your weekly visits down here, searching for a strange character on a scar only you can see? His words cut like a blade to Lan's heart, pinning the smallest flicker of a spark she hadn't dared uttered, had never dared utter that in spite of all she told herself, what she had witnessed on the day of her mother's death had been something like magic. And the scar on her wrist held the clue, the only clue to the truth of that day. Because it lets me hope that there's something else for me out there, something other than this life, the dust motes before her swirled, stained red and orange by the setting sun, like the dying embers of a fire. Lan set her hand over the slip of parchment. Perhaps there was something to be learned in the instructable strokes of that character. It was the closest she'd gotten in the past 12 cycles after all. The imagery in this is amazing. I just wanted to say that really quick. I'll take it, she said. I'll take the scroll. The old shopkeeper blinked, clearly surprised at this development. Ah, he tapped the scroll. You be careful, eh, you two. I've heard too many of a tale of marks created by dark demonic energies. Whatever's on your wrist inside that scar, well, let's just hope it was left by someone with a noble cause. Superstitions, Lan repeated. 
All superstitions must come from somewhere, the shopkeeper said ominously, then crooked his fingers. Now let's see the payment. Nothing comes for free. Got rent to pay, food to buy. She hesitated only briefly. Then Lan leaned over the counter, brushing aside a small sack of herbal powders Old Wee had been weighing, and placed a ragged hemp pouch on its surface. It landed with a clink. Old Wee's hands darted out, pawing through its contents. His eyes widened as he drew something out. Ten hells, you two, he whispered, and drew his old paper lamp closer. In the light of the flames, a sleek silver spoon glistened. The sight of it brought a stab of longing to her heart. It had been her prize find, accidentally thrown out with the broken dishes in the back alleys of the tea house. She'd been counting on selling it to buy off a moon or two from her contact in the tea house. The thing would clearly fetch a small fortune, for metal, any type of metal, was a relic of the past. One of the first things the, Atlantean, the Atlanteans did when they took over was to monopolize the supply of metal from all over the last kingdom. Gold, silver, copper, iron, tin, even a small silver spoon was a rarity these days. The Atlanteans stopped short of seizing all the metalware in the last kingdom. Lamb surmised that a few spoons and some, and some coins and prized jewelry were hardly enough to build weapons of resistance for a revolution. Land knew where all the metal was going, to the Atlantean magicians. It was said they channeled magic through metal. That Land could believe. She had seen with her own eyes the terrifying power they held. They had brought down the last kingdom with nothing but their bare hands. They had killed Mama without even touching her. I couldn't sell that spoon, Lan lied. No one's taking anything metal these days, and it's more trouble than it's worth if an Atlantean officer ca catches me. Not to mention, Madame Meng will have my skin if she finds out I stole it. Just use it to get some ginseng for some old lungs, will you? It chafes my ears to have to listen to you cough like that. Right, old Wee said slowly, still peering at the silver spoon as though it were made of jade. The remainder of her proffered payment, a sack of ten copper coins she'd earned from her day of sales, lay untouched. Possessing any metal can be dangerous these days. Leave it with me. His gaze sharpened suddenly, and he broke into a toothy smile. He leaned over her and whispered, I think I'll have something really good for you next time. Source of mine's introduced a hen court dog to me, and he's in the market for... The shopkeeper stopped and drew in a sharp breath, his gaze darting behind her to the paper screens he'd thrown open to let in the cool evening breeze. Angels, he hissed, switching to the Atlantean tongue. The word sent terror spiking through her veins, Angels was short for white angels, the colloquialism that Atlantean soldiers used to refer to themselves. Land spun around. There, framed in the framework of old Wee's shop windows, she caught sight of something that made her bile rise to her throat. A flash of silver, the gleam of a white gold emblem with a crown and wings, armored color, armor colored in winter's ice. No time to think. She had to move. Land cast old Wee a frightened look. But something in the old shopkeeper's expression had steeled. His mouth pressed into a resolute line. He caught her hand as she reached for the scroll. Leave it with me, Yatu. Don't let them catch you with something like this on the eve of the twelfth cycle. Come back for it when it's safer. Now go. In the blink of an eye, the scroll and silver spoon had vanished. She tipped her dually over her shoulder, her, over her head, just as the bell over the entrance rang. Over the entrance rang. A toll now sharp with menace. The air think thickened. Shadows fell over the floor, long and dark. Land made for the door, glad for her rough hemp duanda, a loose, cheap garment that concealed most of her figure. She'd worked long enough at the tea house to know what Atlanteans would do to hen girls. Four gods preserve you, she heard old Wee mumble to her. It was an old hen saying based on the belief that the four demon gods would watch over their motherland and their people. But Land knew, with cutting clarity, that there were no gods in this world, only monsters in the form of men. There were two of them, burly Atlantean soldiers dressed in full armor, their steps clunking as they passed her. Instinctively, Land's gaze darted to her wrists, and it was then that she loosened a breath. Bare wrists, no glint of metal cuffs, wound so tightly that they seemed fused to her flesh, no hands that would summon fire and blood with a flick of pale fingers. Just soldiers, then. One of them paused as she passed him, 
The door just paces away, a silver of cool evening air already bruised brushing her face. Her heart lurched like a rabbit's beneath an eagle's gaze. The angel's hand darted out, fingers closing over her wrist, and that seed of fear in her stomach bloomed. Say Maximilian, the soldier, the soldier called. With his other hand, he flicked out the rim of her dooley. Land stared into his eyes, the youthful green of a summer's day, and wondered how a man could make a color look so cruel. His face might have been cut of the marble statues of the winged guardians the Atlanteans erected over their doors in their churches, handsome and utterly inhuman. Didn't think I'd find such a fine specimen of flea in this kind of a place. She'd learned the Atlantean tongue, she'd had to, to work at the tea house, and it never failed to strike ice into her veins. Their words were long and rolling, so different from the sharp-cut dragonfly touch characters of the hen speech. The Atlantean spoke with the slow, unhurried slur of a people drunk on power. Lan hailed very still, not even daring to breathe. Leave the thing be, Dinarin, his companion called, already halfway to the counter, where old Wee bent at the waist and bobbed his head with an obsequious smile. We're on duty. You can have your fun when you're done. Dinarin's gaze rolled over Lan's face, down her neck, and lower, and she felt violated with that single look. She wanted to scratch out those youthful green eyes. The angel shot her a wide grin. That's too bad. Don't you worry, my pretty little flower. I'm not letting you go so easily. The pressure on her wrist increased slightly, like a promise, a threat, and he released her. Lan stumbled forward. She had one foot out the door, hands pressed against the handle when she hesitated. She looked back. Old Wee's silhouette was small between the hulk hulking Atlanteans, a shadow in the setting sun. His roomy old eyes flicked up to her just for a single moment, and she caught the tilt of his nearly imperceptible nod. Go, you two. Land pushed through the door and ran. She didn't stop until she was well clear of the stone parapets that marked the entrance to the Eve Market. Ahead stretched an expanse of darkness that was the Bay of Southern Winds, glittering crimson as it caught shards of fading sunlight in its waves. Here the winds were sharp and briny, rattling over the wooden jetties and whistling over the old stone walls of Hot Gong as though they wished to raise the land itself. To be so free and to be so powerful, what might that taste like? Perhaps one day she would know. Perhaps one day she would be able to do more than gift an old ailing man a slim silver spoon and run when danger knocked at the door. She tilted her face to the skies and breathed, messaging the part of, massaging the part of her wrist where the soldier had grabbed her, wishing to scrub the feeling of his fingers from her mind. Tonight was the winter solstice, marking the twelfth cycle of the Atlantean conquest, with the highest Atlantean officials in the land gathering for the festivities. It made sense that the government had increased surveillance and patrols across the largest ten cities. Hot Gong was the southern Atlantean outpost, the jewel of trade and commerce of Atlantean colonies, second only to the heavenly capital, Tianjin, or, as it was now meant to be known, King Alexander Town. The twelfth cycle, Land thought, Gods, has it been so long? She closed her eyes. If she closed her eyes, she couldn't remember exactly how the world had ended her world. Snow falling like ashes, wind sighing through bamboo, and the song of a wood lute weaving to the skies. She'd had a name once, her mother had given it to her, Lianair, meaning lotus, the flower that bloomed from, nor from nothing but mud, a light in the darkest of times. They'd taken that from her. She'd had a home once, a great courtyard house, green weeping willows sweeping stained glass lakes, cherry blossom petals coating phantom paths, fanstone paths, ver verandas yawning to the lushness of life. They'd taken that from her. And she'd had a mother who loved her, who had taught her stories and sonnets and songs, who had nurtured her calligraphy stroke by stroke across soft parchment pages, fingers twined around hers and hands wrapped around her entire world. They had taken her mother, too. The long, booming tolls of the dusk bells echoed in the distance, cutting through her memories. Her eyes flew open, and there it was again, the empty sea looming so lonely before her, echoing with all that she had lost. Once upon a time, she might have stood there at the precipice of her world and tried to make meaning of it all. How had it all gone so wrong? 
How had she ended up here with nothing but broken memories and a strange scar only she could see? But as the bell's sonorous tones told to sound across the skies, reality washed over her. She was hungry, she was tired, and she was late for the evening's performance at the tea house. The scroll had been promising, though. She brushed a hand over her left wrist again. Each stroke of the strange and indecipherable, indecipherable character burned indelibly into her mind. Next time, she told herself, just as she had for the past 11 cycles, next time I'll find the message you left me, Mama. For now, though, Lan tipped her dooley over her head and dusted off her sleeves. She had a tea house to return to. She had a contract to pay off. She had Atlanteans to serve. In a conquered land, the only way to win was to survive. Without another glance back, she turned to face the colorful streets of Hot Gong. It began making her way up the hills. Okay, so that was the first chapter of A Song of Silver, Flame Like Night. And like I said, kind of partway through at one point, the imagery that she is giving us in this story is so beautiful and it's elegant and you can just you can really picture where our character is you can you can picture everything the verandas the the plants you know the decorate the decorative things that she's talking about um and of course the oppression you know the the darker things um the you know really old um shops and things that are worn from from history you know throughout the conquests that they faced and things like that um I'm, I really am into historical fantasy. Um, obviously, this is this is not a real his, this isn't real history, um, but it, it's a fictional history. You know, in this in this high fantasy story in this world that our author has built, she's weaved in some actual history um, in this world, and and I really like that because it it you can connect with that. You know, people well not really us, but people where their their land was caught was um, taken over at one point you know it's, it, it's it, people like that can relate to that if at one point in life they faced oppression um, because one government came and took over their own you know so so I like that that's in there you know we can think back to real his real history and how certain colonies or certain people colonized um, different different villages and places that were once harmonious and beautiful and then someone came in and you know sometimes someone else's religion steps in and kind of changes the religion of, of a certain people so she's brought some religion into into this um some people believe in different gods um old we the shopkeeper believes in the four demon gods or i think that's what it was the four the four gods that he believes in um and our main character doesn't really believe in that. So it, it'll be interesting to see if she ever starts to believe in certain things that others are believing in. So that might be where some character development could take place. Um, so it'd be, that, that'll be really interesting to see. Um, so far, this, this is really good. I really am into this. I might read the rest of it myself. Um, I really like fantasy, so I think it'll be an interesting read. Um, and I also wanted to mention that women in the story. So we have some... Um, oppression towards women so obviously she came across some guards some soldiers and one of them was getting a little too close to her kind of harassing her and this is something that has happened historically too you know women have been oppressed um, they have faced abuse by men in power and things like that so it's so that's also in here um, so some real life issues that are weaved into this story to create a real world um, you know and there's different names of places she's just built a whole whole world to dive into here um, like I said this is the first book of the series and I think obviously there will be more um, which we will get those as soon as they come out this one just came out in January so we'll look forward to those um, if you would like to call and put a hold on this book, if this sounds really good to you, you can call us at the library and we'll put it on hold for you because it is available to check out. I have so many books to read right now, so I don't think I will read the rest of it just yet. So if you'd like it, it's available. Um, I hope you enjoyed this first chapter reading of this new book here at the library. Um, stay tuned next Friday for another new book. We'll read the first chapter and talk a little bit about it. I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you for watching.